It was here, in the Cour du Carousel of the Louvre, that the first guillotine of the French Revolution was set up. On the 27th of May, 1792, the National Assembly announced that this palace of kings would henceforth belong to the public, would henceforth be a public museum. And thus it was for six years, until a new landlord moved into the Louvre. David painted him in the Louvre, the only portrait Napoleon ever posed for. Napoleon made additions to the outside of the building. In the Cour du Carousel, he built the Arc du Carousel. The first sculptured horses placed on this arch were taken from the church of Saint Marco in Venice. Napoleon decorated the Louvre in a manner approached by no man before or since and filled it with the finest works of art that the rest of Europe could provide. Thousands of tons of art sent to Paris from palaces, libraries and cathedrals of all conquered nations. When the Musée Napoleon, yes, he changed its name, was decorated to his satisfaction and the Grand Gallery was filled uh, with his artistic conquests, Napoleon decided it was ready for his marriage to Marie Louise. The Napoleonic splendor of the Louvre lasted for 12 years. It lasted until Waterloo. To Napoleon, every work of genius must belong to France. It was a point of view not wholeheartedly shared by the Germans, Italians, Spanish, and Dutch. After Bonaparte's defeat, they came to the Louvre to take back their treasures. It is a tribute to French diplomacy, French tenacity, and French persuasion that many of Napoleon's acquisitions remained in the Louvre. The Virgin and Child of Cimabue, the first painter to give a human look to saints and angels 700 years ago. The Coronation of the Virgin by Fra Angelico, 500 years old, and its colors as fresh today as the day they were painted. The Visitation by Ghirlandaio. Calvary by Mantegna, the sculptor in paint. Other paintings remained because Napoleon had bought them, like the Moneylander by Quentin Matisse, who painted common people and their common desires. Marvelous things remained, and perhaps the most marvelous of all was a tradition. Since Napoleon, the French zeal to hunt for treasures of the past has never abated. Ambassadors of France have caught the fever of archaeology, and what was found in the earth of Egypt, Assyria, Italy, Greece, Persia, Babylon, they sent back to the Louvre. This one, from Egypt, is 4,500 years old.
Napoleon III. He became emperor because he was ambitious, indomitable, and the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. He and his empress Eugenie were married in the Louvre. They were the greatest builders the Louvre has ever known. They did more building here in five years than all their predecessors had done in 700. Because he thought the Grand Gallery of Henry IV was not wide enough, not sumptuous enough, he tore down a large part of it and rebuilt it. It was left to Napoleon III to finally complete the grand design that had been conceived three centuries earlier. When it was finished, it was a scene of splendid royal festivities. Richness was the keynote of everything built by Napoleon III. Blazing Baroque richness, to show the world how rich was the French nation. The French taste, the French way of life. Richness was the keynote of French fashion, exemplified by the Empress herself. But the emperor forgot French restlessness. On the 4th of September, 1870, the communards attacked the Louvre. The Empress Eugenie was forced to flee. She had to run the entire length of the Louvre to escape the mob. While she was finding sanctuary, the Tuileries Palace was being consumed in flames. palace, built by Catherine de' Medici, was completely gutted. For 12 years, Paris looked on these unsightly stones, while the Chamber of Deputies argued whether to rebuild it or to remove it entirely. It was decided to remove it, so that when the Louvre moved into the 20th century, it would be more of a living part of the city than it had ever been before. Its windows would open on a colossal perspective along a way of glory. Its gardens would become one great park, one great playground, one great parade ground. They paraded down the Champs Elysees, across the Place de la Concorde, across the Tuileries Gardens, into the Louvre, expecting to find there the greatest collection of art treasures in all the world. They found nothing, 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 nothing. Months before the last war, while the heads of Europe were busily guaranteeing peace in our time, certain realistic Frenchmen were taking no chances. Let the politicians carry on the discussions about peace, they said. We have work to do. We must empty the Louvre on the still small chance that there will be a war. And so, in one of the great evacuations of history, one of